Hi there, my name is Mark Winteringham and welcome to my talk, Augment Your Testing with Web APIs. I want to talk about two things today. So first of all, I want to share with you an example of how I used Web APIs to support my testing, specifically how I built a Web API to help me test further, test faster, um, whilst working with a, a very large, complicated um, system. And then I want to talk a little bit, I want to take a sort of step back and I want to talk about the the, the patterns, the behaviours that happened, uh, that if we are aware of them, if we observe them, then we can identify opportunities to potentially build APIs to support um, other testing activities or maybe other tools as well. Let me begin by sort of telling a, a, a quick story about this, this web API I built. Uh, it was basically what I called a, a data dashboard by the end. I was working on a project for HMRC, which is part of the UK government. And HMRC are responsible for tax collection um, in the UK. There was this big digital transformation happening within the space and I was working as part of a, a wider platform team um, in which we were sort of updating a lot of the services um, around HMRC. And the result of that was we had this massive um, microservice platform um, that was just growing and growing and growing. But the way everything was structured was uh, we had teams that were focused on specific areas of this platform. So... My team, we were responsible for somewhere between, like, I think, 10-ish um, microservices, maybe a little bit more, I'm not quite sure. And we were responsible for services around sending notifications. Instead of sending letters out to say, you need to file for tax, um, you need to pay your tax, you need to you, you're due a refund, so it's not all bad things all the time, Um Instead of sending letters, we were going to send um, emails and notifications so that you could view all of this online. So yeah, we were responsible for the microservices that made up that part of the application, which was really interesting because the way that it was set up posed some challenges for the testing that I was doing. So rather than doing a sort of a traditional push pattern where we would submit something in a form or something within the UI and then we'd push that data in, get some sort of results back. Um, it worked the other way around. What we had was this bucket that sort of sat at the back of our system, so to speak. And what would happen is some other system built by some other company um, would do all of the sort of tax calculations and the processing of like when to send these letters or when to send these notifications out and they would drop it in this bucket. And then what would happen is, is that each of our microservices were working on schedules. So the first microservice would wake up and it would look in this bucket and it would pull some information into the, into the API. It would process it, manipulate the data, maybe add some extra fields to it or update some other bits and pieces and then it would stop. Then the next API or the next few APIs down the line, they would wake up and they would pull the data from that first API into their sort of services and then manipulate the data again. So the idea being is, is that this data started in the in the bucket in the back end and it would bubble up to the service. And that's where the notifications, that's where the message details came from. A very interesting architecture to be testing. We were lucky enough that we could deploy this sort of stuff locally. So I would have the environment, our, our part of the environment set up along with other supporting APIs. And then I would do exploratory testing and I would come up with hypotheses, questions, ideas around ways in which like, what if this data was in this way? What if this information was added? And I would put them in the buckets and then I would have to sit there and wait for things to sort of appear in my UI. And that was pretty slow going. It took me a long time to do my testing. Um, and what made matters worse was that if something failed, it would fail in one of those APIs. So I would just, I wouldn't see anything in the UI. So I would have to open up like nine instances of, um, or like nine terminal windows and connect to each of these databases and run queries against the databases in each of these microservices to find out which one had the problem. Very slow going, very frustrating. And then, you know, I find out what the problem is, have a conversation, 
maybe write out some some issues and bug reports about it and then I'd start again. Yeah, I was getting quite frustrated and it was just taking me a long time to get through all these different steps. So one thing I realized was that the databases that we were using were called uh, MongoDB. And at that point, I don't think this exists now, but at that point, MongoDBs had an HTTP interface and we could turn them on locally. What I did was I turned them on and I realized I could actually make my queries via HTTP requests. Rather than going in, opening a terminal window and writing everything in, I could just do one request. So I saved that request as a bookmark. So I basically had a bunch of bookmarks sitting on my um, on my browser so that I'd run some testing. And if something failed, I could just click a link and go through them. It started to speed me up. I like I didn't have to go through all those complex steps to um, find that data. So that was really cool. Um, but I started realizing that it was still a bit frustrating because I'd have to have nine tabs open. I'd still be cross-referencing the data and everything would get a bit messy. And I always have too many tabs open anyway. Um, so I got to this idea. I was like, well, it'd be really good if I could get all this data into one view, if I could just look at it all in one go. So I was like, well, how do I get all this data from all these different requests together? So I started experiment with some JavaScript and it was a bit messy. And then I thought, well, what if I just built a very, very thin API that just made these requests for me? At the time I was playing around with Node and with JavaScript. So I set myself a little project where I built this API. And what it would do is it would go through. So I, I had one endpoint. I would make a request to that endpoint. And then that would go off and make all these calls to all these different APIs and um, query the databases and get all the information back. And then it would collate it all into one big JSON object and send it to me. Now I was at this point where I could actually see everything. So if something failed, I could immediately be going, right, make a call to that API. What information do I get back? Which is very cool. And again, speeding me up a little bit further the analyzing side of things became a bit easier. And then I made this sort of final leap where I was looking at this data and I was a bit like, oh, this is interesting because this data, if I if I visualized it in some way, so I've got all these different APIs that I'm, these databases and these APIs that I'm calling distinct requests on. What if I just did a little bit of styling and put them into nice little boxes? So just added just a very sort of a, a, a thin layer of UI onto it. And it was literally sort of create boxes, um, just little tables on a, on a, on a web page. And then I just um, added a little bit of jQuery at the time to just make the request to the API for me and then inject the data into each of these boxes. And what was really interesting was by making that sort of visual leap, I started seeing that actually what I had was a model of the system that I was testing. I had a visual um, representation of all these APIs and, and, to, and how they spoke to each other. Uh, each of these boxes had names that sort of determined which API was what. I arranged them in the way in the flow of these APIs and how they would work to let the information bubble up to the surface. And then finally, I just put a five second refresh on the page. So every five seconds, this data dashboard would start updating. And what was really interesting was that not only um, had it, you know, like by this point, I've really, really sped up in my testing because I just didn't have to connect to all these databases anymore. I didn't have all the terminal windows to manage. I could just look at this, this screen. But it started affecting the different ideas I came up with because I could see the application in a visual manner. I could be like, well, what if I go down this route? What if I go down that route? Oh, I tested this idea out and I can see it's already, it's frozen somewhere in the middle. I can see that API has not been running for a while. I had a visual cue to help um, speed me up. I started at this position of, I've got a load of testing to do and it's and it's it's proving to be slow but what i ended up with was with a tool that actually not only sped up and increased and like just helped me with my testing but it it kind of changed it it kind of made me think about it in a different way and what was also really interesting was like after i built this tool um i could see that others in the team were expressing interest in it they wanted to use it as well and they started using it for de debugging issues so it became sort of a utility to the main application. And as that application progressed, we would make changes to this, this dashboard. Obviously, there could be other tools that could have been used to do this work for me. And I'm not 
not disputing that. What I think is really interesting is the journey. The journey I took um, to identify this opportunity to build an API. And that's kind of, I want to take a step back and talk about like opportunities within um, exploratory testing or within other testing activities. Uh, triggers that make us think of ways in which we could potentially use tools like web APIs. So yeah, taking a step back, regardless of what you want to build, I think it's important to reflect on when to sort of identify those opportunities. So I run a training course with um, my colleague Richard Bradshaw called Automation in Testing. And we talk about the idea of automation opportunities, different actions, different behaviors that we can reflect on um, to identify what uh, automation we want to do when. So there's six of them, uh, repetition, shadowing, uh, OGs, um, time, steps, and boredom. So starting with the repetition one, I think this is really interesting because this is where I think a lot of ideas of automation come from through the form of repetition. You know, we want to be able to replicate testing uh, quickly um, with a tool. And that comes with its own inherent problems that we're not going to get into in this talk. But it is certainly a good cue. So if you find yourself repeating to do things. So for me personally, I found myself repeating the act of opening these terminal windows up and connecting to all these databases and doing these queries. The fact that I was repeating those things, that became sort of a highlight to me. I was like, hang on, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to do something else. Um, so, yeah, noticing when you're repeating yourself, doing the same actions um, in your testing, that could be an opportunity to use some sort of tools to help um, speed that repetition up um, so that you can get to the fun stuff in testing. And then there's shadowing. So shadowing is a really good way to actually observe some of these other behaviors. I think sometimes when we are when we are testing or when we're just doing various activities and we're stuck in that repetitive loop, we're so sort of concentrated on the on the act of doing something that we don't take that step back to go, oh, hang on, I've just done that same thing 20 times. Maybe I should do it somehow differently. So with shadowing, you have someone working with you. So pairing is a really good opportunity um, for this. Um, and I know a lot of uh, discussion, a lot of talk is done around sort of um, pairing in a programming sense, but also pairing in a testing sense is, is really valuable as well. So by observing or being observed, you can identify some of these other, these other patterns, these other behaviors. And then OGs. So some of these opportunities are things that we've done multiple times um, or uh, behaviors that we sort of display to others, but sometimes they're feelings. So that feeling of, oh, geez, not this again, um, that frustration as well, that sort of almost like, you know, I can imagine rolling your eyes as you're sort of thinking, oh, God, I've got to do this. I've got to do this again. Oh, I don't want to do this again. So that feeling can be a trigger. If you're feeling frustrated, um, then maybe there's some sort of opportunity there. Maybe you're doing something fairly algorithmic that could be uh, replaced with a tool. And to be clear as well, like these things I'm talking about, I'm not saying replace the whole thing um, with, with automation, but this sort of mixture of both. So I'm using tools to help me get a certain way down the path before I pick it up. And then time as well. So if we find ourselves just wasting time, a good example I have of this is um, I worked on a project where just getting the environment set up just took a long old time. So identifying that as a time suck, realizing that that like that was all of that time that I spent setting up and reinitializing the environment could have been doing other testing or doing other activities. So we started looking into sort of infrastructure tools as well. Yeah, using time as a factor as well. If you if you feel like something's a waste of time, then maybe automation is a space for you. And then steps. So we talked uh, talked briefly just then about with the OGs one about this idea of you know using automation to get yourself a certain step of the way before taking over the testing, and that's what steps is used for. Talking about that API example about creating data for me, the reason why I created that API was because. 
I would I was testing an application that required lots of fresh data to be created that I would then trigger different things to happen to change that data. So I needed just a load of vanilla data in different formats. So rather than going through the UI and clicking things manually and stuff like that, um, I actually created this API to um, just make all of the requests for me and, and do the work for me. So I could just call post create me 20 news pieces and it would create them with some random data. Now, something just to add to this as well with that example, some of you might be thinking, well, why don't you just create it in the database? Or, you know, why don't you start up the database or start up the application with a load of fresh data? And yes, that is possible, but sometimes the testability of a product, um, sometimes the way it's architected, sometimes the way it's locked down, prevents us from doing those things. But sometimes with these opportunities, you're thinking of ways to sort of compromise by building that API that made that data for me. It was quicker um, and easier than trying to sort of have a whole conversation with the ops department to give me access to the database and go through security policies and that sort of thing. I was doing everything within the spirit of, of all of the security policies and that sort of thing. And then finally, uh, the one I think that's quite important is boredom. Um, for me, testing should be fun. It should be exciting. It should be engaging. You're being creative. You're thinking of ideas. You're, you know, you're engaged with the, the subject matter that you're, you're testing. If you're bored, if you're disengaged, then I don't really think you're testing anymore. I don't think that you're really receiving or any information. You're not observing things. You're too focused on the task at hand. So boredom can be a massive trigger for you. You know, those are my six examples. Repetition, shadowing, oh geez, time, steps and boredom. To wrap up, um, what I've shared today is, first of all, an example of how to use um, APIs in a way that's not necessarily for like production systems, but by identifying um, opportunities, uh, things that I was doing in my testing to, to build an API for. And it may be that either you're the person doing the testing or you're on a team where testing is happening. If you're doing the testing, then, you know, it may be that you need to have a conversation. You might identify an opportunity and want to have a conversation with someone else in your team to help you um, build this API. But if you're someone who is actually, who builds things as is a, is a developer, then maybe sit down with other team members and talk to them. Like, what, what are your frustrations? What's slowing you down in your testing? How can we maybe build some tools to help uh, speed that up? And then finally, the triggers. There are six different ways in which we can sort of reflect on what we're doing to help find um, automation opportunities. That was my talk. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to find out a little bit more about me, uh, as I say, my name's Mark Winteringham and I've written the, the book Testing Web APIs, uh, which will be coming out soon. Um, you can catch me on Twitter at 2BitTester. Um, I'm the COO of Ministry of Testing. So if you want to talk about anything testing related or anything going on in the testing community, please get in touch at mark at ministryoftesting.com. Uh, all that's left of me to say is uh, thank you to Manning for letting me share this story and I uh, hope to speak to you all soon.